I am here with Jeff Hoffman, who's a successful entrepreneur, proven CEO, worldwide motivational speaker, published author, film producer, and producer of a Grammy-winning jazz album in 2015. He's been the founder of multiple startups. He's been the CEO of both public and private companies and has served as a senior executive in many capacities. He's been part of a lot of well-known companies, especially, you probably know, Priceline.com, Ubid.com, ColorJar, and many more. Jeff is the author of Scale, Seven Proven Principles to Grow Your Business and Get Your Life Back. But uh, it's so nice to have you here, Jeff. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Well, this is going to be fun. You're welcome. I uh, was looking forward to our chat because obviously you are very successful and we can learn a lot from you. Uh, I, um, I was watching some of your videos. I went back to your TEDx talk from a long time ago, which really was interesting to me because I'm writing a book on curiosity and you're talking all about the power of wonder. And I laughed at your beginning of that, talking about the five-year-old. <laughs> And how children do ask a lot of questions, don't they? And well, it's it's where it all starts, right? You mm -hmm. know, pretty much every great discovery, no matter how old or young you are, mm -hmm. started because somebody was curious about something. Somebody was wondering about something, and they started probing and thinking and digging in a little farther. So it just, you know, the reason that I did that, and I can't wait to read your book, uh, oh, that you. is because we start that way. When we're kids, we're in awe of everything, and we wonder about everything, and we question everything. And as we get older, the one some people just lose that natural childlike curiosity about the world around them. But what I started to notice is the world's greatest innovators never do. They're the people that never lose that sense of childlike wonder. So that that's what that was one of the observations I made about uh, some of the people that I looked to, up to. They all seem to still have that curiosity. Well, that brings up an interesting point because, first of all, I'm curious who you look up to, and secondly, why do you think they don't, don't lose it? Well, you know, I ask people this, and it's just kind of a, a, oh, why they don't. I was answering the other one, why some people do. Well, I'd like uh, to know people, both. <laughs> you know, people just sort of get in their channel, right? We get uh -huh. so focused, and, and that's why I even did an experiment one day because I was thinking about the fact that, that we get so used to our surroundings and the sort of day-to-day -day grind that we just stop seeing things. I did this crazy experiment once just for the heck of it. I had given a coworker that lives near me a ride to work in my car. And on the way home, I said, Hey, I want you to drive, even though it's my car, drive me home, oh. uh, you know, back. Cause he lives near me. Uh -huh. And so the route I drive every day in my life to work, I sat in the passenger seat of my own car. This is definitely a metaphor for me. Um, uh -huh. sitting in the passenger seat of your own life. Right. Uh, I sat in the passenger seat of my own car. And as soon as we started driving, I said, oh, wow, I've been driving across town for dog food. I didn't know, I didn't know they'd opened a Petco right there. He said, Jeff, it opened like two years ago. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I just didn't see it anymore. Uh -huh. And there was a new Mexican restaurant, which was already a year old. And I started to realize I get in my car, just like you do in your life, and you're so used to going, you can practically do things with your eyes closed. But the bad part is you stop looking. Right. Uh, so I, I just wasn't seeing so many things around me and I wasn't curious about them anymore because they didn't. The reason people lose it a lot, I think, is because it doesn't really affect their day to day life. Right. Uh, right. It's not part of their job. It's not part of their ride to work or whatever it is. So they just don't wonder. But I started this in kind of a reverse way. Uh, people that I know that were successful. Mm -hmm. I was asking this question. Uh, what what is it they're doing that everybody else isn't? What is common? What are the common traits and behaviors of those kind of people? So when I got a chance to be around uh, people like that, that you know, that whose accomplishments I particularly admired, like you know, last year I did this trip to the UK, for example, with Steve Wozniak mm -hmm. from Apple, and the whole time Woz and I were traveling, I noticed this same trend. These are the people that actually stop to pick up shiny objects. Uh -huh. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I mean, they will yeah, say, funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they will they'll say, Hey, wait a minute, what is that? Yeah. And, and you're thinking, Well, who cares? We were on, we were in the middle of this. Uh -huh. But they do care and they say, I wonder what that is and how it works and then they want to take it apart and see what's inside of it. Uh, and they just it, it is a I think it's a thirst for learning. Yeah. And constantly, constantly they want to know more and they want to know why and they want to know how. And and those are the people that are just much more likely to be the great innovators because they stumble upon things that nobody else even looked at. You know, it's interesting you bring up Wozniak because he was here in Phoenix at a 
speaking at an event, and I got to t t talk to him for a minute, and it made me interested in reading his book, I Was. And at, at the beginning of his book, he talks about his father and how much his father um, impacted his desire to learn about things because he taught him how, not only how to create something, but why things work this way and why you needed to connect this wire to that and what it did and how it, you know, brought in all this different, um, you know, aspects of w the importance of things. So he had, you know, his environment really set him up for success, I think, you know, or, you know, our parents have a big impact, our, our teachers, our peers and all that. And, and when I was looking at the things that hold us back, I, you know, a lot of it's fear, a lot of it's our assumptions that we don't care about something or we think we know about it. And some of it's technology and, and environment, I think, is a really huge thing. So I, I'm curious about your environment uh, growing up. Did you have a Wozniak kind of experience that set you up to be this guy that you turned into, or well, not quite as much, but I very, you know, for for your listeners who are parents, mm -hmm. I very much agree with that environment. Encouraging your child when they ask a question, say, well, why, well, you know, why don't you open it up and see what's inside of it? Why don't mm -hmm. you walk over there and look? Encouraging that curiosity. So I didn't have that, uh, you know, a lot of my uh, growing up was with a single mom, but mm -hmm. um, it was it was not as much as not as strong as Wozniak's in terms of pushing and explaining, but it was more the uh, why not. Mm -hmm. Right. If you suggested, she said she would. Oh, my mother was the kind that would always say, well, why not? Why not check that out? Why not go see what that is? Why don't you go over and ask him why he's doing that? Mm -hmm. So. She was very, very encouraging in that whatever you thought of, she never said why. She always said, why not? And, and that was a good thing because I always felt, I always had permission is yeah. the way I felt. I have permission to explore and to wonder and to try things. And I don't know if some kids did. Mm -hmm. I would see other parents that would say, who cares what that guy's doing? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter to you. Just do what you were told or whatever. <laughs> and my mom would say, well, why not just go ask him? So yeah. I think that at the minimum, Having permission gives you a lot more freedom, and better yet, like in Waz's case, having you know having encouragement is even better. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting the impact that your family has, and I, um, you know, I noticed you went to Yale, and my father's family they all went to Yale, um, and it was kind of like that was what was a normal thing is you had like English majors and certain things. The business sense in my family wasn't, you really don't need to get a business degree. And so I was kind of like the outlier <laughs> in my group uh, that just never really kind of went the, the direction that others did. And with you, did you go to Yale because of the same kind of reason? But you got a degree in computer science, right? I did, but I'll tell you, the environment I was in, so I was, you know, out in Arizona mm -hmm. is where I grew yeah. up, right? And, oh, yeah, that's uh, right. Uh, uh, my high school was, was uh, right there in North Phoenix. Mm -hmm. But it was, I'm <laughs> just going to be honest, I, I played football as well. Uh, Friday night football was a lot more important in the community uh, than my AP calculus class. <laughs> um, so I wasn't in a private school where they really pushed it. I know a lot of kids I went to high school with that, you know, either didn't go to college, just got jobs or, or you know, not a lot of them went away mm -hmm. uh, to big school. So my environment in that case didn't really push me. For me, it was that same curiosity. And specifically, Yale was because there was a – it's ironic now, given what's going on around us. Mm -hmm. There was this thing called artificial intelligence. <laughs> and – only a few universities in the whole country were studying it and researching it. It was like Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and Yale. I didn't really – MIT had some. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really know Carnegie Mellon, which was, you know, too bad for me. It's a great school. Yeah, Stanford yeah. was too big and too close to home already for me. Mm -hmm. uh, MIT was too technical. So my main interest in Yale was I wanted to, to go study artificial intelligence, and they had a great program even back then. So, wow. But it was, a, it was all my friends – went to Arizona State or University yeah, of Arizona. So for me to say, okay, for yeah. me to say I'm going to go as far from home as I can to a school I can't afford to study something I know nothing about uh, was not the norm, uh, but it was just really, really what I wanted to do. I love that, that you had that drive to do that. I, mean, I would have loved to have gone to Stanford. That was probably high on my list. But, I, I mean, I stayed at ASU, and it was a good education. But, you know, I think it's, it's like what makes you kind of – push yourself out of the nest even, you know, a little bit more than somebody else to go do this kind of thing and go away from home. And, and that's the kind of thing I want to instill in people um, because I've taught so many business courses and I see so many students that who just 
don't really push themselves very much. You know, they kind of do the minimum and they kind of want people to figure things out for them. And you figured things out for yourself. And I, I, that's why I was really interested in talking to you today. I mean, just what you did, you know, with Priceline, did they just have the 20 year anniversary, right? Yeah. Can you believe that was 20 I years ago? I can't. <laughs> How cool is, is it to work around William Shatner? Have you gotten to talk to him much? Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he just is naturally just that funny. Um, <laughs> what, He's funny. So, uh -huh. yeah, you gotta, you got to love that. I, I happen to have that same... I love dry humor, which not everybody does, I right? Do. I, always loved all, I always loved all those British shows back uh -huh. in the day, Monty Python right. and stuff. So the dry humor was definitely a style that I love, but he just delivered on those commercials yeah. oh, for sure. He is great. I love dry humor too. He's already he's already got one. Is one of my favorite lines from Monty Python. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's so um, interesting to see what you did with that company. And did it turn out to? What were you thinking when you started that? And what did it turn into that you had no idea would happen? Well, well you know the the idea on the intellectual property uh, came from an inventor in Connecticut named Jay Walker. Mm -hmm. So Jay is the guy that had the original idea, mm -hmm. and he had he had the IP, right? He had mm -hmm. patented the reverse auction, mm -hmm. uh, and you know what Jay did was assemble a group of people to turn these ideas into businesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, so back then, it was a gathering of people around Jay's ideas to say, how do we create business out of those? And what's interesting is the original idea was not a travel company at all. Oh. The original idea was, uh, and I remember Jay's words the first time we sat down, uh, were to harvest consumer demand and do a reverse auction. The Internet is seller-driven, mm -hmm. right? So you're a buyer. You want to buy a pair of shoes. It's all on you. You got to find out who sells the shoes. Then you got to see which people have your size. Then you got to see who has your color. Right. Then you got to see if you like the price. Then you got to see if it's in stock. And then you got to see if, if the shipping's good. All the work is on you. Uh, the original idea that he had was why don't we just ask, ask people what they want and how much money they have and let's see what we can do for them. So hence the name your own price. So ah. the idea, the original idea to build a buying service where you say, look, I got a hundred bucks, you know, where can I stay in New York for that or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the original idea, not a travel company. And so back then we actually were launching uh, various buying services. We were trying to do groceries. We were trying to do gasoline, a bunch of other things besides travel, but travel was up and running first. And then, you know, it was only a few years later, remember that the whole internet bubble crashed right. and everybody was kind of like, now it's a public company by then. And people are saying, "Hey, the travel's going great. Let's not let's not break into any other markets right now." But that was the original genesis of it: was to reverse the way commerce is done and let the buyer be in control of the process, not the seller. Well, I mean, it totally. What's happened is reinvented travel, and you know how people do you know different things. I mean, we've seen so much reinvention of different industries, and you've been one of the pioneers, and so it has you know Elon Musk and a lot of people out there are just taking everything and and flipping the way we think about it. What do you think is the next industry that's ripe for that reinvention? You know, I think there's two that I've been looking at. I've been looking at them literally on a global scale. We, we just a few weeks ago hosted the uh, Global Entrepreneurship Congress over in Istanbul, and we had entrepreneurs from 171 countries join us. Uh, so we had a great opportunity to talk to the whole. In fact, last week I, was, last week I went and uh, spoke at the United Nations. Uh, about mm. about global problem solving uh, to address the UN 17 goals to make the world a better place. So mm -hmm. had a chance to talk and visit with entrepreneurs all over the world looking at this. And, you know, there are numerous ones, but I'll tell you a few that I'm that excite me. First of all, education is one. Right. Um, everybody, you know, pretty much agrees that the educational paradigm, hi higher ed, is an outdated paradigm and it's not working for today's young people. I'm sure you get this, but I can't oh, yeah. tell you how many times they say to me now, why do I even need to go to college? What am I getting out of that? Mm -hmm. I could I could start a company for the amount of money I'm spending. <laughs> I hear that right. I hear that a lot. Uh -huh. But what I'm seeing is instead of trying to completely rewrite uh, the educational infrastructure the way it is, a lot of entrepreneurs are just creating new ways to learn. Uh, so education, I, I'm just seeing some great innovation in the education space, healthcare. Yeah. is the next one, uh -huh. uh, that, that a lot more people are looking at pretty much home health care, 
what te technology, what could I, like I saw one the other day as an example. It was pretty much an EKG on a smartphone. You plug the cables <laughs> into the phone, plug them into yourself, it does the reading and sends it uh -huh. uh, all over a server to a doctor. Instead of you driving to a medical center or a hospital where you lay down and they have to hook you up to a machine, home health care. Uh, and just rewriting the healthcare uh, in a you know preventative way digitally was one. And I would say the third one. I also just happened to host the Global Agricultural Challenge recently, uh -huh. and about six, sixty-five countries came and participated. And it's literally a hack hunger. It's people reinventing the way we feed the world and making it optimal. So uh, there's just still wide open opportunities to rewrite industries that are not efficient, like education, like healthcare. And, and, and like food and agriculture. That is so interesting because uh, you just listed every uh, job I've ever had. <laughs> my first, one of my first jobs was in agricultural chemicals for three or four years. And then I went into um, pharmaceutical sales for another 15 years. And then I've been in education for 12 years. So you've, uh, you, that's my resume of what I've done. And I couldn't agree with you more. And, and a lot of those areas all need some help. And I think I, I think that it's interesting to talk about higher education because I still teach a lot and I've taught more than a thousand online business courses. And I think that what I've seen is I, I love online education for learning things. And, and I think that we I've been on some board of advisor meetings and things where we talk about different things of what needs to change and what, you know, that type of thing. But for me, what I hear a lot from people is you know, they want to get value from their education, but sometimes I hear they want to get, um, you know, like a more of an a la carte system where they, they could pick and choose because everybody's learning in smaller bits and pieces and, you know, they want online. The thing I worry about with any kind of change that they do with education is that they'll get rid of the soft skills and the humanity type things that are the glue kind of, you know, that hold it all together if you start doing things piece by piece. Do you think that we're going to see oh, problems I, I, in that? I think not only do I completely agree with you, but that's the worst possible trend of all because that's what we need more of. Right. Part of part of the problem we're having in the world is we're losing those because everyone's hidden behind a device now. Mm -hmm. Right? They're losing their soft skills and you know, I've spent my whole life as a CEO and literally have hired thousands of people over the years and those are the skills that were always harder to find before this uh, you know, yeah. before everybody got hidden on a device and before education started to fracture and soft skulls got weaker. So I think that's a problem we as a society everywhere, globally, have to solve. Mm -hmm. soft, soft skills are in, you know, high demand and, you know, and rare occurrence, mm -hmm. and they're just so much more important now. We live in a complicated world, and people have to have them. I don't know what the answer is, but I hope a lot of people listening as well are saying, you know, are thinking about how do we increase the focus on soft skills in the educational system and not decrease it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think that the reason we still have so much uh, degree programs and things like that is because va employers value them, right? And, and they that's a, a prere prerequisite for certain jobs. I mean, it was for me as a pharmaceutical rep, they wouldn't even look at you if you didn't have uh, a degree. And so as long as that is still the case, if we're still creating degree programs, uh, when I was uh, working on the MBA program as the o MBA program chair, I was incorporating a lot more soft skills because... I, I really think that emotional intelligence is huge in all the communication issues and all that stuff is, you know, we're not really, if we're not getting it in college and companies aren't really prepared to, to teach them, they haven't really been that I've seen. And I've seen a lot of companies complain at some of the events. I go to a lot of Forbes summits and things like that, where you get some of the best of the best on stage. And a lot of them are saying, you know, they're hired for their their um, uh, you know hard skills or their knowledge and they're fired for their soft skills or their behaviors. So I would like to see companies do more of that. And, and with my work in, in Curiosity, that was kind of one of my um, goals with finding out what's holding people back because I think a lot of people are not really being successful because they're not developing their sense of curiosity, which, you know, which would lead to improved engagement, improved uh, innovation, improved productivity, you know, all the things that people are complaining about that they're not seeing out, out there. And that's uh, a real huge problem, I think. But I, I think that you had some really interesting advice for people um, in your TED talk that I saw of things that you think are good to do to just 
help with innovation and just get you outside of your normal way of thinking. And I think we could do it with soft skills and a lot of different things if we just focus on things that we don't normally focus on. And you said you write down everything that interests you. I don't know if you still do this because this is an older talk, but you had written down things that interested you and then you wrote down the data points and then you'd kind of like look at them later to see how they all connected. Do you still do that and how important is that? Yeah, and, and I, you know, I made up a term for that uh, so I could share it with people, which I call that info sponging. So, uh -huh. you know, the, the whole idea, again, like you and I were talking earlier, is that people get, you know, uh, so focused, they, they stay in their lane, mm -hmm. right? And they're so focused. I'm in healthcare. Right. So if if, I, if somebody says I'm in healthcare, then they don't really care what the banking industry is doing, right. right? Or the retail industry or anything. If you ask them, they'd say, "Wait, what does that matter? We do we do healthcare." And so, what I was trying to do, and part of this again was modeling who I think are you know the the greatest thinkers of our time, uh, is to say the that to schedule time to literally get out of your lane. So what I do is I try to do this like 10 minutes every day. And I tell people, if you can't do it once a day, do it once a week. For 10 minutes a day, even though you work for a healthcare company, you have to spend 10 minutes out of healthcare. You don't work for your company. You don't work for your industry. And the challenge, what, what you're referring to, what I do is learn one new thing every day. But learn one new thing that you don't need to know. And at the time, you have no idea why you're learning it. <laughs> what I do during the info sponge is I say, okay, I just follow my curiosity. I got, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, leave my, my job mentally behind me for a minute, my industry. I'm going to go read about something, a new technology, a trend, a company, something happen in government or regulations, whatever it is. Learn one new thing every day outside of your life, outside of your industry. And then I write down one sentence, a one sentence summary of what I learned. And then the idea is what happens is some of those things stick in your mind. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't stop thinking about it. And those are the ones that, that I use the analogy of puzzle pieces. If I gave you a piece of a puzzle and asked you what this was, you'd say, Jeff, you gave me a blue puzzle piece. <laughs> if I gave you two or three pieces, you would say, I don't know what this is. But if I gave you a new piece every day, and if every day you put them on your table and you move them around and move them around one day, with enough pieces, you would call me all excited, and you'd say, "I figured it out. This is about. This is going to be a castle in Ireland. That's what it's making." And that's the idea with knowledge: mm -hmm. is collect disparate pieces of knowledge from different industries and all over the world around you, and constantly put them on the table and push them around. I literally write the ones that really stick in my gut on on you know on post-it notes, sticky notes, and stick them on the wall. Stare at them, move them around, stare at them again. And what you're trying to do is be the first person to figure out how to combine these things. Let me give you a really quick example in a way nobody else ever has. All right. um, you know, because I, I heard Travis, and, and I'll come back in a sec, explaining one day, uh, researching the sharing economy. There's one puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. And then researching micropayments, the way to pay people without anybody having to have cash or, you know, anything like that, um, and, and exchanging money directly. And then researching, you know, home-based business trends and the desire for people to see if they can make a few bucks before and after their regular job. And it was all these trends that he put together. The transportation industry was last. You would have never created Uber by looking at taxis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He created Uber by saying all these disparate ideas could be combined in a way no one's ever combined them before. And he created a sharing economy, home-based work, micropayment-enabled transport service, the world's biggest taxi company without ever buying a car. If you'd started at the other end, staring at the taxi industry, say, I want to start a company, you would have immediately gone and bought taxis. Yeah. Um, so that's the idea of info sponging. Study, force yourself to learn something new every day or every week uh, from the world around you, and then just constantly move those puzzle pieces around in your mind and, and see if you can be the first person in your industry to combine new ideas elsewhere in the world into something new and innovative where you are. Well, I found that's a trend. With I've interviewed uh, many other billionaires um, that who have this same mind that you have that just do that same kind of thing. I, I've had Ken Fisher, uh, Naveen Jain, Keith Kroc, Greg Newmark. I'm thinking of the people I've interviewed, and they're like you um, in the fact that how successful and that. And it, but they also, I'm thinking of a conversation I had with Naveen uh, where he was saying that he just likes to go into industries and in, that he knows nothing about and just reads everything he can to figure it out for himself without like with new fresh eyes how do you think 
How important is that to just go into something you don't even know to try and reinvent it? I think that's a, a great idea. And I know Naveen and I'm a huge fan of his as well. Um, and I like, I like that he is, uh, you know, and he's definitely imprinted that on Anker, on his son, uh -huh. um, yeah. that wide open thinking. But I think that is exactly the right idea. Mm -hmm. um, innovations, I, I'll tell you one really fast one that inspired me many, many years ago. I was just reading a story of a fast food burger chain that was not innovating, not growing, and it kind of reached its limit. And the owner, you know, kind of said to his management, Guys, we're not we're not growing anymore. We're not winning in our industry. Do something different. So all of them sort of went inside to look at the French fry machine and the Diet Coke machine and how do we innovate by looking in their industry. One of the guys, and this is a true story, said, you know what? I'm going to go see just what Naveen did. I'm going to go study everything I can about another industry, see if they have any good ideas. He went to look at banks. And his colleagues were like, banks don't make french fries or cheeseburgers. Why are you wasting your time? But I'm going to tell you what happened. He went and visited, looked at, into banking. And he was physically visiting some, mm -hmm. and he didn't really learn anything in the first few. But on the fourth bank he went to, the par he couldn't park because the parking lot was full of pickup trucks, piles of wood, hammers, nails, and carpenters. And he said, what are you guys doing outside here? And they said, oh, our bank came up with a cool new idea. We're building it. And he said, what are you going to call What is it? And they said, when it's done, we're going to call it the drive through window. <laughs> <laughs> so... He shot back to the fast food place, and the first drive through window in fast food did not, was not created by anybody in the food industry. It was created by a guy who stole it from the banking industry. And that company, I don't remember the name of it offhand, was actually later acquired by McDonald's for its innovation. Wow, I had not heard that story. That's a good one. Yeah, isn't that amazing? <laughs> so N Naveen's right. Go see what good ideas the rest of the world has uh -huh. in other industries and see if you can apply them to yours. Well, and I think that he does have some great ideas, and I think that there's a lot of uh, things to be learned from all you guys, and I think the thing that I found interesting about some of the stuff you do is, you know, you're, you talk a lot about just within the companies that you already have created and, and how to get to create a culture that creates a company where people want to work, and I, I've interviewed Doug Conant from... Um, Campbell Soup, who's in every case study, every course I've ever taught, we talk about how he helped with engagement and, you know, improving that. So you have a big focus on culture and building teams and designing for scale. And I want to talk about some of the stuff that you, you do, because you, you, you talk about the importance of coaching and mentoring and some of the things I've seen. How hard is it to create a culture that people want to work for? Well, here's the thing. It, it's not rocket science, it turns out, but it's because here's where I see it go wrong. And I now work with lots and lots of, you know, sort of companies and, and executives that I mentor and coach. They, uh, when you're the boss, mm -hmm. you have the, especially if you're the founder and, or owner of a business, you have this bad habit of thinking it's about you. It's my company. Mm -hmm. I own it. I run it. And in fact, the most successful businesses are the ones where the leaders figured out that, that you need to surround yourself with people smarter than you, and then pretty much get out of the way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So literally spending time, I was always so busy sitting in the office running the company, and what I learned was you need to schedule. Like maybe it's every other Friday. Every other Friday, you're literally going to schedule yourself out of the office to go hunt for talent. Go somewhere. One time I went to this tech meetup that I had no idea what it was, but people said, then why are you going to it? And I said, because I'm pretty sure that's where all the tech people are, <laughs> and I want to find the most talented ones aren't going to wander into my office, uh -huh. and the headhunter might not find them because they're not looking for jobs. They're gainfully employed. Mm -hmm. But what if I went out to where they are and found them, right? And, and so I started realizing that I need to get out of my office. I need to hunt for and find talent. Then I need to do things to nurture, grow, and serve them, uh, literally. You, you know, your job as a leader is to build the place where the best people in your industry who could work anywhere they want, all want to work for you, and they never want to leave. That's a different job description than I'm the boss and I have to run the company. What I have to do is build a place that people smarter than me will run the company for me and never leave. So i got to spend more time doing things that make them want to stay and less time trying to do all the work myself. And when, it's, when I realized that, I think that our companies you know, really turn the corner because we had people that stay. I've had people that work for me for four companies in a row. Uh, because we, you know, we, we took care of each other. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's very challenging for, to 
have some of the people uh, you mentioned working from wherever you want and a lot of jobs are going virtual now and how do you find people that work who work really well virtually and you know you said go out and find them is there like a good way to do that um, you know, I don't love uh, the virtual worker. Uh -huh. When I have a choice, I'd rather have everybody in the same building. Uh -huh. uh, and my employees always say that as well, right? Because collaboratively, when they can look over each other's shoulder and toss ideas out when they're there. So clearly, our preference is always to work in the same place. But recognizing in this world, there are people that telecommute and work from home and work virtually. Um, it does make it harder, and it can be done. Uh -huh. I'm just being honest that I, I prefer... That's my second choice, not my first choice. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the good news is in an online and kind of social media, uh, you know, an in, in interconnected world, people group themselves. There are always interest groups. So I literally, the example I gave you, I, uh, you know, at the time overheard that word uh, tech meetup. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't really even know what meetup was. So I said, what's a meetup? And yeah. someone said, ah, oh, these tech people will, will just randomly pick a pizza parlor and they'll all show up there at 10 o'clock at night for, you know, pizza, uh, and whatever. And they just, it's an open meeting to people that don't know each other. That's why it's a meetup. All these tech people just show up. So there are, when you start to ask in any one, in any particular skill that you need, if you need financial people, um, there are organizations and events and associations that all these people group on. So my point was just go to them. Like one time there's a, a trade show I'd never heard of called SHRM, yeah. the Society for Human Resource Managers. Uh -huh. I've never even heard of it, uh -huh. but I needed a good HR person. Mm -hmm. And I said, where do those people gather? And someone said, oh, they all go to SHRM. I was like, what is SHRM? Never heard of it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, everyone in HR knows what SHRM that show is. I'd never even heard of it. <laughs> but somebody said, you know, it's a great place to find a good HR manager. Buy yourself a ticket to SHRM. Go there one day and just meet people. Right. So I actually went to that once. So. These You can find the interest groups for the kind of people you need, but my point is go to them. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for them to wander into your office and hope. Go find these really talented people because the really skilled ones probably aren't looking for a job anyway. Yeah, it, it, it is a um, tough thing to find people in the right atmosphere. That's funny about Sherm because I teach a lot of HR courses, and it is a really great um, organization. And uh, I think that you've done some... The, these different companies you've you've created, you, you probably require different types of people based on the different industry. And and I'm curious on color about Color Jar. Can you tell me more about what that is and how you got involved? Yeah, Color in Jar is you know we call that company. Uh, I think we founded it about five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, think Think Plus Build. Okay. Um, a lot of people. What we got really good at as a team. Uh, was launching things, right? You know, there, there's other parts of the spectrum. Um, uh, we're not the long-term operator. We, we just were sitting and talking as a team, my whole team, and we were, we were saying, what are we really good at? And the part that we're best at um, is launching things, taking a new idea, picking the right market for it, who should we aim this at, right? Positioning and messaging it so that that market wants it and understands it. So product launches is really uh, what we got good at. So that was the genesis of Color Jar was let's help people launch things. But the think plus build part comes because the think part is before you launch anything, make sure you're pointing it the right direction, right? <laughs> so we do a strategic – and we do a strategic positioning. We sit down with companies and say, who do you think is going to buy this product and why do you think and what functionality of the product do you think they want? We make sure that your product and your audience are positioned facing each other properly with the highest chance of success. The build part is uh, that we have a, you know, because we come out of tech, we have a strong technical team to build all the technology from e-commerce engines to online inventory to mobile apps, all the things you need to support that. So that's what the company does. Well, you're, you, you, brought up um, strategic and I'm thinking about the, the differences I teach my students about this strategic versus tactical I mean you, you're obviously a very creative guy and uh, ma managers tend to be more tactical leaders more strategic do you think it's easier to be Steve Jobs or Wozniak you know in that setup I mean which, which uh, you that's, that's <laughs> funny because uh, Woz and I had that very conversation and uh -huh. and this is just my personal opinion but I think the greatest thing of all is getting both, yeah. right? I got to know Paul Allen. There would be no Bill Gates without Paul Allen. Right, 
Right. Uh, uh, you know, just like you said with uh, with Waz and Jobs. I think, in fact, my very first company was a company called CTI, Competitive Technologies, and I had one of those. So having having whether it's a co-founder or whatever, having an inside and outside person, somebody that inside is building product and operations, and somebody outside. Uh, that is, you know, uh, is finding markets and delivering the product and the messaging to them. I think it's great to have, absolutely great to have both of those people. It's hard. It's to rare. Find that, them. It's rare that well, most definitely. <laughs> it's rare that one person is equally good at both. It, it's usually more than one person to do that. And you're right. That that's why I was saying that they're not going to wander into your office. You've got to schedule time and go out and hunt <laughs> for the kind of people that you're looking for. Uh, but it's worth it because when you find teams like that, you know, that's when the amazing happens. I, um, I, I've known Rich Carlgard for a while. He's an editor at Forbes, and he's a very smart guy, and he had written a book about that. And he, uh, just the importance of having the complementary personality that, that uh, you know, you, you can't know everything, like you said. And sometimes, do you think it's normal just to have two people that are like that, you know, or do you need more or – do you have any examples of anybody that can do it all by themselves? I'm trying to think of any examples of that. I don't really, I haven't really found those people that can do it all by themselves. Right. Even, <coughs> excuse me, even when it appears that way to the outside, because one person is the one on stage and in the, you know, mm -hmm. doing the marketing and doing the selling. So you see the one person, mm -hmm. what I've learned from visiting companies over a lot of years, all over the world is even if you don't know the other person, or people, there's, there's, it's never one person pulling all the strings. Mm -hmm. It's, it's always a well-rounded interdisciplinary team. So I just don't think, and that's advice that I always give people: stop trying to do everything yourself because you're not going to pull it off anyway. You're not good at 15 different things. Nobody is. I have yet to hire, uh, you know, a, an engineer who also does my taxes and writes my marketing copy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you're good at uh, a lot of things. It just doesn't happen. I mean, you're doing producing movies and musical events. What What are you doing on the side as far as that goes? I I see you're working at charity events with Elton John and Britney Spears and all these. What What's it, that? Well, about? here's the thing, though. Um, I, I've you know, well, well, I've actually moved around and done a lot of things. And this is important, especially what what I, I tell to young mm -hmm. to young entrepreneurs is it's always one thing at a time, though. Ah. Um, I, I, I believe focus is critical. So, you know, at the time when you're involved in something like Priceline and somebody comes up and wants to give you say, hey, I want to tell you about this idea. You know, your answer needs to be if it's not going to help me get, you know, butts in hotel beds, uh, <laughs> uh, then then call me next year. And then later, when we did the music company, you know, your answer is, if you're not going to fill the seats at Friday night's concert, call me next year. So being able to focus, you can do a lot of things. But, you know, a as you talked about with Naveen, you go, what starts with is a deep dive into that industry. Mm -hmm. Researching. When I first got into music, I read everything I could find, and I reached out cold called, first starting with the people I know, then just cold calling and emailing people I don't know. And, you know, you get a lot of doors slammed on you, but trying every way I could to learn as much as I possibly could about the music industry before we ever set one foot into it. So you got a lot of homework to do, a lot of reading to do, a lot of research, and then a lot of, a lot of meetings before you ever get into it. But if you stay focused on one thing at a time, you know, what I always get a kick out of is people label themselves based on a skill. When you say, hey, what, you know, tell me about yourself, yourself they say, I am an accountant. Mm -hmm. And what I always think is, actually, you're not an accountant. You're Maria, mm -hmm. you know, an, ama an amazing woman, mother, wife, whatever. You just happen to have learned accounting. Uh -huh. And the reason that I say that is because then they see themselves that way. When I said I was going to start this music company, everybody said, quote, you can't, Jeff, you're a software engineer. Mm -hmm. I said, well, not a software engineer. That's the thing I learned last. Now I'm going to go learn music, right? So it was kind of funny when... You know, when we produced the we produced a jazz album that won a Grammy a couple of years ago, uh, and you know, it, it took to that level. I said, okay, so now am I a music person? Uh, because uh, you know, whose definition? Um, but anyway, I think that's important. Don't consider yourself an accountant, a lawyer, or whatever. That is a thing you study. That is a thing you know. But the same skill set and intelligence you used to learn that thing. It is it is exactly the reason you can learn something else if you wanted to. So, you know, I learned software engineering and later I learned music and then we went and studied filmmaking and made a film. You know, now we have a brand new venture where we're kind of in the process of uh, 
of buying an NFL football team. So I've been studying everything about sports and sports ownership. That's funny because I talked to Naveen. He owned uh, the baseball team up where he is, right, for a while. And I said, or I think it was baseball. And I asked him if he like he didn't even like sports. He said he had to <laughs> learn all he could because he, you know, he was interested in the business of it. And, you know, it is interesting. That I'm trying to think of who would slam a door on you, though, by the way, when you said you had doors <laughs> slammed on you because of your position. I'm kind of surprised by that. But, you know, we all get no's. Uh, and it comes back to what I was saying on the environment thing for curiosity is we've talked ourselves into we're an accountant or, you know, software engineer or, right. you know what I mean? Cause people label us that way. And I, and I think people get those, you know, the golden handcuffs, they don't want to leave an industry because of money or they don't want to change because of, you know, it's, it's hard. And I like that you have this open-minded, I can do anything. But then again, to also going back to Naveen said, he said, it's easier to run a billion dollar company than a million dollar company. And then there's a certain level where, you know, it takes money to make money and it's easier to, to, um, do certain things at a higher level. Do you agree with that? I think that's true, but but you know, there's no <laughs> every billion dollar company was first a million dollar company and it was first before that a one dollar company. Right. So I don't want people to lose sight of everything started somewhere. Because mm -hmm. sometimes people look at something big and say, I could never do that. Mm -hmm. I said that's because you're looking at it now. Uh it didn't start that way. It, you know, every single uh great entity started with that first step and started somewhere small and made its first dollar. So I don't like it. But by the way, the other thing that bothers me sometimes is the number of times people come up to me and say something to the effect of, I'm building the next Facebook. And I don't mean necessarily social media. Uh -huh. I mean, everybody thinks that everything they do has to be this huge global, you got to stop thinking that way. Go start somewhere, build something, and the next one will be bigger. Uh -huh. You know, Solve a problem where you live. You don't have to save the world on day one. And I see that too much. People have this idea that if it's not grand and glorious, it doesn't count. And in fact, if you think about it, you know, I was thinking about this on this, uh, the, the speech I just gave last week at the United Nations, thinking about our country. You know, America uh, wasn't built by the Facebooks and Googles. Mm -hmm. It was built by millions of small business owners with dry cleaners, with restaurants, with landscaping companies. Uh, we're built by the concept of entrepreneurship, but it's not all grand and glorious. It's people feeding their family, you know, uh, uh, become building their own companies, growing them where they can. I, I just don't like it when everybody thinks everything they have to do has to be this global juggernaut or it doesn't count. It does count. Every single effort counts. Every company counts. And, uh, well, if you're thinking, though, about your legacy, I'm thinking about your legacy challenge. So I got to ask you, if your funeral was today, how would you so how would people summarize your you and your life? And what do you wish people would say about you the day you finally die? Where did that come from, by the way, <laughs> that you asked that, that? You know what? That, that came, unfortunately, my my best friend in the whole world, Michael, oh. Uh, oh. passed away young. He kind of he drowned in a freak accident in the North oh. Sea in Ireland. Uh, just, you know, the odds of that are so low, but it happened. Wow. Um, and at his parents, uh, they wanted me to do the eulogy. And at his funeral, when I was walking around getting ready and just thinking about, you know, my, losing my best friend, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about people were talking about his life and they were summarizing him. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my gosh, if Michael was here today, he'd kill himself all over again <laughs> because you got him completely wrong. You people didn't understand him. Uh -huh. And I was thinking, if this is how you're summarizing who he was and the life he lived, he'd be very disappointed. And so that moment, I thought to myself, I sat down in a chair there, the funeral, and I thought, wait a minute, if I died right now, and, and I challenge people listening to do this, take out a pencil and ask yourself a really honest question. Again, if you died right now and this was your funeral and people were there talking about you, how would they describe you and your life? So I wrote down what I thought they'd say, and I was afraid most people would talk about our business exploits and business successes. And I was like, wow, what a disappointment. Because then you got to ask yourself the second question, which I did, which is, what do you want people to say? So now you ask yourself, what do I think people honestly would say if my funeral today? Then ask yourself this, what do you wish they would say? And, and you know, I, I remember thinking then I don't really want to be judged by number of deals or dollars made. I want to be judged by the number of other people's lives that I made better. I love people to walk by and say, man, I'm so glad I knew him because he positively impacted my life. So then I went to the third thing which is, are you actually doing that? 
Are you leading a life that is that's going to create that? Uh, it's going to lead to that. And honestly, for me, I was thinking, you know, we spend all our time chasing business deals, and and you know, and you know, trying to make more money or do another deal or whatever. And I wasn't really doing that. So that really helped me refocus. The last few years of my life, I have spent, you know, so many weeks and days and months uh, mentoring business owners and entrepreneurs around the world because that's what matters. To me. That's the legacy that I want. So once you know what what you want your legacy to legacy to be, you got to ask yourself that question: Am I actually doing anything to make that happen? And for me, that really did require a change. I actually was then was the CEO of UBID, which we take in public, and you know I resigned uh, from that sort of CEO life and said I'm going to spend my time as a mentor, actually creating the uh, legacy that matters to me. And so you've been doing that for how long now? Well, it was supposed to be a year or two, and this this is year six. And I think I have, besides all over the U.S., I think I have got, met with entrepreneurs in about 60 or 70 different countries on this sort of mentoring world tour that I've been doing for five or six years now. But they've been the most fun and fulfilling years of my life anyway. I've been enjoying this way more than I did any business deal I've ever done. Wow. And so how many hours a week do you work? I, I'm curious because of all well, this. I didn't plan <laughs> to be working the amount that I am, but here's what happens. Okay. Every time I every time I say I'm done for the week, there's another call or another email. Uh -huh. And it's some other entrepreneur that says, look, I got this amazing idea. I just don't know how to start. I don't know how to build. There's any way you could help me. And, you know, it, it's sort of figuratively each time I feel like I'm climbing in bed because I'm tired and I need a nap. And then I read that and I say, you know what, I'll just go. <laughs> and I sit up, put my shoes on, and head out again. So... I have been working, uh, honestly, the last couple of years, I've been working a lot of very long weeks and hours, but it's because it's motivating to me. I, I want to do this. I don't, you know, it's not stuff I have to do. It's stuff that I absolutely love doing. And there are so many, as much as you turn the news on every day and it's all bad news, mm -hmm. the truth is there are amazing people all over the world doing incredible things. They just don't make the news, the news, mm -hmm. right? You know, a school shooting, we'll talk about that for, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. Uh, that's going to dominate or politics is dominating the news or right. Roseanne or something. Yeah. Uh, and all these amazing people out there that are creating a better world uh, through, you know, through entrepreneurship and through hard work, they just don't make news, but they're out there. Uh, and they, you know, they give, I feed off of their energy. And so I wind up putting in way more hours at this point in my life than I ever thought I was going to, uh, but I can't help it. Well, I, you know, I, I think that some of you guys who are so successful, I mean, it, it is something you just have in you, the need to, to work and achieve, you know, it's just kind of, uh, and to help others. And, and I think, you know, it's fun to talk to just the, I remember talking to Craig Newmark and some of the others on my show about what you've done now that you've achieved this level of success and you've got this, you know, I mean, billionaire status and what you could do with all your money and do what, is there anything that you do unusual uh, that you, that you, what's the most wild thing you've done now that you can do it? Well, I think it's what we're doing now. Uh, we're in the process of buying an NFL football team, yeah. which is something I never dreamed of being involved in. And I'm a huge sports fan, and football is my number. I love all sports, but football is my number one. And so uh, this has just been a, a crazy fun thing to be doing. Uh, well, you know, I think it's, it's amazing what you've accomplished. And I'm, I'm really uh, it had so much fun talking to you. We have so much in common. Are you ever going to move back to Arizona? Um, it's possible. <laughs> I always thought about that as a kid growing up there, that I might retire there somewhere, uh -huh. someday. Well, make your decision in a few months. Don't come out in the next few years. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so nice to have you on this show, Jeff. And I'm sure a lot of people would like to know how they could find out more about you. Uh, do you have a website you want to share? I sure do. I, I have jeffhoffman.com. And, you know, that's the email address is just jeff at jeffhoffman.com. That's the best place to find me. Wow, that's really nice. You know, Naveen did the same thing. He gives out his email. Do, how many email do you get a day? I get a lot. <laughs> um, but I will tell you this. That gives me something to do on all those long flights uh, as I fly all over the world. Usually what I do is download all my emails. So I, I will say, 
when people email me, it may take me a while to get back to people, but I always do eventually. Uh-huh. Eventually, I catch up on all my emails, and I do read them. It just takes me a while because, unfortunately, I can't always keep up with the traffic. You know, I've had two people from my show this week. They're out of office emails, so they would get back to me, but they're in the Himalayas. <laughs> thinking what are the odds of that do you have that as an outgoing message too (laughs) um i usually put the please be patient with me i'll get you when i can (laughs) well this has been so much fun jeff thank you again thank you very much talk soon okay